Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you for coming. And I know people are sort of filtering in. We're going to get um, started here um, to allow uh, for enough time uh, uh, going forward for, for um, Julia to speak. So we are really, really privileged. This is my great privilege today to, to introduce Dr. Uh, Julia Grapsa, um, who is a lead for tricuspid bed valve imaging at Guy's and uh, St. Thomas's New uh, Trust in the um, and is a reader at uh, in cardiology at King's College. She's an associate uh, uh, director uh, or associate professor of cardiology at, at um, King's College, if you have had that right. Um, is founding editor in, uh, in, uh, and was editor in chief for, for up until about two, two weeks ago, maybe less than that, of uh, Jack Case Reports and uh, associate editor of Jack. She is a phenomenal um, imager and person, um, has done a, quite a bit of, of, of work in um, both the women in cardiology space as well as the tricuspid I imaging space and um, with, with a lot of, uh, I think, a really important uh, area that all of us are are very much interested in. She she's, has a number of uh, leadership roles. Um, uh, only a couple of them are on the slide right here, but they go, the list goes on within the EACVI and within the ESC. And so um, couldn't be uh, sort of more privileged and proud to sort of uh, have her speak on, I think, a topic that's near and dear to all of us. So thank you so much for joining us uh, from, uh, across the pond. And, um, and thank you so much for, for um, coming in and aligning us. Thanks. Thank you so much, uh, Jordi. It's a great honor to be here with you. Like, um, it's a topic close to my heart because um, 17 years ago, I started working on the tricuspid and the right ventricle. So um, it's an honor for me to be here and discuss uh, uh, about this topic. So practically um, what I will be discussing is the anatomy and physiology because, uh, you know, starting from the basics, I think it's very important with the tricuspid. It's such a complex entity and together with the RV that it's uh, important to understand uh, the basics and then echocardiography, multimodality imaging. And um, we will discuss a bit about the surgical and structural interventions. And um, I'll, uh, I have updated my lecture uh, to reflect also some um, presentations that they took place at the TCT in San Francisco. Just to um, my only disclosure is that I'm currently working with Cardiovascular Research Foundation and uh, I'm overeating um, the ECHO, so I'm participating at the Alliance trial. So as we know, uh, the right ventricle is uh, very complex. I won't say this that the Francisco Maezano uses the word forgotten chamber still, but we were saying that um, it's not valid to use it anymore, but it's not forgotten. Actually, there is an explosion of uh, right ventricle and tricuspid interventions and the interest around the tricuspid, but it's briefly uh, described as three parts, so the inlet, the trabeculate, apical myocardium, and the outlet. And it's coming as the anterior part of the heart. That's why it's quite challenging to image this uh, with a transthoracic echo, and then we use more advanced uh, imaging. But the three leaflets uh, that they supported by the cord tendon and the two discrete muscles, uh, papillary muscles, actually, um, they have a, a different anatomical structure. So the anterior leaflet is the largest and um, the, usually the posterior leaflet has more scallops and um, the septal leaflet is the smallest, which is important for us when we are doing the imaging for structural interventions. And of course, when we are screening patients for procedural success. But uh, just to mention that some people, they, when they see different scallops, they call these commissure leaflets. And uh, however, we should, uh, it's very, I will show you later how there is an update classification of the types of the tricuspid regurgitation and the tricuspid anatomy. But also the tricuspid annulus is related because uh, um, in uh, 2006, there started the, st the main studies for the tricuspid annulus. As you can see, the first study by uh, Fukuda in um, circulation, it showed that the tricuspid annulus was very far away from the subtle shape of the mitral annulus. And it, uh, it, he compared the normal patients versus those patients that they're getting a tricuspid annuloplasty. And then of course, uh, Gilles Dreyfus, when he was working at Herfield, he uh, was the first one to develop this hypothesis that the annulus is dilating towards the anteroposterior direction when we have the RV remodeling. Me in 2012, a little bit later, um, I reconstructed the um, tricuspid annulus 
together with the leaflets. So we were providing the angulation of each leaflet versus the annulus. And then it was the first study to demonstrate that practically, because we compared the normal patients, patients that they had post-capillary pulmonary hypertension, thromboembolic and PAH, and we actually saw that the remodeling is very different and the angulation gets compromised. So practically the way that the tricuspid valve is behaving is getting compromised depending on the pathology. And then, as you know, Becky Han um, uh, suggested the uh, different um, echocardiographic um, nomenclature depending on the type of the anterior papillary muscle and where it's based. And then uh, whether, for example, the septal or the posterior leaflet or the anterior leaflet, they have more than one scallops. So we call it tricuspid valve, but sometimes someone might say, oh, it's quadracuspid or five cusps, but practically some, some people you will hear saying, oh, it has more scallops, one leaflet, or some other people, they, as I said, they will call it commissural scallops. But the most important is uh, practically, again, this helps for us to understand the anatomy of the patients. And as you can see, 54% of your patients will have type one anatomy, which is the typical tricuspid valve as we know it. And here is the, the transgastric view, which is the most important for us when we are guiding structural interventions. And then we can provide uh, the, the information to the, our colleagues where the jet is coming, because we know that most of the patients, they will have easier anatomy when it's coming, the jet as anteroseptal, and it's uh, like closed with anteroseptal clip more often and easier. And then, or of course, if it's commissural and so on. But um, it's very important, but because of uh, this paper from Becky Han, we have also a new classification of uh, the tricuspid regarding pathology. And as you can see, I'll show you later that uh, it's very important, the classification between atrial and ventricular pathology. We have so many patients with atrial fibrillation that they have post-capillary pulmonary hypertension, that practically what happens is that the atria are getting dilated, then the annulus is getting dilated, and then you have tricuspid regurgitation with a normal right ventricle. But it's very different than ventricular tricuspid regurgitation, where the right ventricle remodels accordingly, and then um, you will have a, a compromise of the RV function. But um, it's very special and unique entity, as you can see, this patient with the tricuspid lead at the bottom is uh, those patients that they have devices because there are different mechanisms, I will show you later, of um, compromising the, the tricuspid valve and also the primary pathology. This is a, a nice table from the TVARC document that was published two weeks ago from Becky and other colleagues. And practically, they describe how the RV compromises depending on the pathology again. For example, like look at the leaflet restriction that uh, in um, ventricular uh, tricuspid regurgitation will be only in systole. There is no leaflet restriction in atrial. Well, actually there is uh, in systole and diastole when we have device related tricuspid regurgitation. But um, this concept between uh, the atrial and ventricular tricuspid regurgitation is very important because for us as imagers, our responsibility is to prepare the interventional and surgical colleagues whether the RV will recover after any procedure. I think that's, that's my duty as an imager. And practically we see that there are um, there is a, a whole um, a sequence of events taking place, especially when it's ventricular tricuspid regurgitation because the right ventricle adapts to the remodeling. There is uh, eventually some a degree of uh, pressure overload and these patients, they are more frequently getting mixed pulmonary hypertension. And also we see that patients that, uh, I'll show you later, the importance of the RV dilatation and impairment of the RV function, that uh, it has a, a direct impact on uh, suc successful outcomes when we come to operate on these patients. But these were the first studies that in 2017, that they started taking uh, normal patients, then those in sinus rhythm, and then also those with chronic atrial fibrillation, but we start seeing more and more that they have dilated atria and then tricus significant tricuspid regurgitation. Now, for example, that we, in my hospital, that we have dedicated uh, tricuspid clinic or as a part of valvular clinic, they send me a lot of patients with atrial fibrillation. And uh, just uh, this is um, a table from a recent paper in Jack Imaging that we described the TR mechanism depending on the Carpentier classification. And here I show you two examples, one with a tricuspid valve endocarditis. And of course, you never, you see it once, you never forget it. This is a patient with carcinoid. That um, 
this uh, type of morphology of tricuspid valve, uh, we also see in those patients that they have radiotherapy. But of course, the first uh, thought uh, when we see such a valve restricted leaflets, free flow TR is uh, carcinoid. Now, right ventricle, as I told you, is very close to my heart. It's a, a chamber with a low pressure circulation. We know that the guidelines give it up a mean pressure of 20 millimeters per mercury that um, from a right heart catheterization to characterize then uh, raised pulmonary pressures. But it is a, a, a chamber that has one sixth of the mass of the left ventricle. And that's why any acute uh, changes in the afterload, they will lead to major changes in the RV pressure volume uh, loop relationship. And um, as you know, there is the interventricular relationship to the LV. That's why we have a lot of patients with postcapillary pulmonary hypertension or mixed. And um, we, as uh, we were moving with our studies in understanding the uh, fibers on the right ventricular myocardium, we know that there's three separate mechanisms, the longitudinal fibers, and then uh, there is traction onto the free wall uh, to the LV and of course the circumferential fibers. And I'll show you, of course, how um, they separate and what has, the, is, has this impact on the RV. But practically, there are stages. So we grab a patient when the RV will start getting remodeled. After a point, the RV gets adapted to the pressure overload. So it gets dilated, then it starts getting hypertrophied. But in order to maintain the cardiac output, then uh, the heart rate increase. There is increase in wall stress and oxygen consumption. Uh, but there is a final stage that I will show you here that the patient is failing. And uh, what we have seen is uh, that so there are four different stages that the heart, the right heart is compensating. Then uh, there is a transition phase that there will be still RV remodeling. It will get dilated, pressure loaded, and then the, it fails. And it has been proven that when it fails, then the right ventricle will get extensive fibrosis. It will become in a sense ischemic. And then the, this is immediately associated with outcomes. Now, very important concept is the RVPA coupling that you will see more and more being used in structural interventions. And this is important because we didn't know up to now who, who are the patients that they will actually, after an, a procedure, will dump the right ventricle, that the right ventricle will get acutely impaired and the patient eventually will die from right heart failure. So that was a problem for us. And then uh, we started demonstrating a great interest on RVPA coupling. And uh, it seems that uh, when the RV contractility can no longer compensate for the increase in the afterload, then there is uncoupling. And then uh, these patients with uncoupling, as I will show you, they have, uh, it, this is, has been associated with uh, very poor outcomes. We know that tricuspid agarization is immediately related to survival. And uh, actually, there is a paper by Ofen. Um, I didn't include this here uh, because it's uh, only a single publication that shows that even patients with mild tricuspid agarization, they have an impact on survival. But definitely, we know that these patients, that they have more than moderate tricuspid agarization, that uh, they will have um, a, a hospitalization because of heart failure and, of course, death. So it's a uh, associate with higher mortality, independent of the degree of pulmonary hypertension and atrial fibrillation, or of course the RV systolic fu uh, function. Here are the two studies that we did on TR and of course the RV performance. So I studied 800 patients with uh, PAH and we had a follow-up of seven years. And we did a, a multi-parametric risk score and our main outcome was the outcome of death. So we saw that practically severe tricuspid agarization had the highest hazard ratio by far in this risk score. And then we had, of course, uh, the hemodynamic parameters like increased pulmonary vascular resistance and pericardial effusion, but also the dilatation of the right atrium. But we, th the outcome of death was completely relevant to the degree of right ventricular systolic pressure or of course, uh, some other parameters uh, such as the myocardial performance index. But then um, with uh, Jonathan Afilalo, and this was a study that started here in Boston at the MGH, we practically got this uh, a massive population with PAH patients and we did the leaflet area and we associate that with the severity of pulmonary hypertension. And practically we saw that the leaflets, uh, the tricuspid leaflets were actually keep being adapted to the pressure overload. So the hypothesis by Dr. Levine that he's a senior author on this publication was that also the tricuspid leaflets getting adapted to the pressure and volume overload. Now, as I said, the, 
a modern problem, and uh, we see more and more patients with that, is are those patients that they have lead-related tricuspid regurgitation. And this is because when we started the structural interventions, that um, we didn't know what to do with these patients, that there is impingement of you know, the leaflet because of the, of the pacemaker lead. And uh, there have been a lot of uh, this, a lot of discussion. And uh, I truly believe that we need an EP physician always when we are dealing with patients with tricuspid regurgitation. And of course, when uh, for every patient with tricuspid regurgitation, more, even more when we have a lead related tricuspid regurgitation. There are several mechanisms, as you will see here, the four different examples of why a tricuspid uh, a lead, a lead, lead can cause a tricuspid regurgitation. And sometimes uh, if uh, the leaflet is getting in pins, then of course edge edge repair is impossible. So they using mostly replacement, but there is, um, we did a special issue on tricuspid with PCR tricuspid focus group that was published last April on uh, with the top cases, clinical cases from around the world on how they manage tricuspid regurgitation. And uh, for example, um, a group from Spain, they are uh, practically moving the tricuspid lead in order to leave space for the for the clip and so on. So there are several different maneuvers that they have been suggested. Now, quickly, when we assess the tricuspid valve, of course, uh, it's our duty, um, as we were discussing with uh, Jordi at the beginning, we have a very different, uh, uh, a, a bit of different system with our physiologists, but we all uh, making sure that they, we have excellent standards of uh, scanning and imaging. And uh, it's a multi-parametric approach. For example, like uh, 15 years ago, they were asking me, tell us the one single view, which is the gold standard for RV and tricuspid. There is none. I mean, you cannot say this. And uh, practically, you need to get all the um, uh, images to have, you go more lateral to get an on-axis uh, apical four-chamber view. You assess the coaptation gap. And then, of course, uh, uh, many patients that they will have dropout or poor imaging, we will do um, TE in order to assess them whether they are suitable for structural interventions. This is a, a video that practically it's a, a supplement for the, our publication at Jack Imaging, and it shows the, um, the, the basic echocardiographic views on how to assess the tricuspid regurgitation. But um, as we know, for us, we are dealing uh, with echoes every day. There are certain uh, tips and tricks on how to make the best of the TR assessment. And practically, we know that um, it, it needs to be, as I said, on axis, the continuous wave Doppler needs to be aligned. We know that the uh, 3D vena contracta can be un underestimated when we have multiple jets. So I, I won't stay long here because it's quite technical from an echocardiographic perspective. I may uh, getting boring for these, page, these people that they, they are not uh, echo fans. But practically, the most important here in the echo assessment is that um, we added two more degrees. We knew that the guidelines up to now said mild, moderate, and severe TR. And then uh, people said, hang on, we have patients that they're coming with free flow TR, and we have patients that the coaptation gap is so large that practically in the vena contracta is so large that they are not going to benefit from, let's say, tricuspid edge to edge repair. And then uh, what they did is they added these two more degrees, massive and torrential, to the severe TR. Why? Because it's important for transcatheter, tricuspid valve repair and replacement. As you will see here, it has a different vena contracta width. For example, for torrential TR is more than 21 millimeters and different estimate the orifice area by PISA. And also the regurgitan volume is more than 75 ms. But uh, this is again from the TVARC document that was published almost two weeks ago that practically they demonstrate that while here the regurgitan fraction, they the fraction they have it unique more than 50%, but they say they have different endpoints uh, for the vena contracta and the effective orifice area. As I say, the main point is why we are using different classification because simply we want to be, to have strict criteria to grab these patients that they are not going to benefit from an edge-to-edge repair and they may be more suitable candidates for advanced therapies such as evoc and so on. So it helps the imager to give a more precise image for the tricuspid to the interventionalist or, of course, the surgeon. Now, going to transesophageal echo, more or less, um, uh, we discussed uh, this use. Uh, so we 
It offers greater sensitivity and specificity to the tricuspid valve. We make sure uh, that there is no dropout on the leaflet. So we have to see all three tricuspid leaflets. And many times um, we, the, a topic for discussion in our lab in, in Britain in general at the moment is that we have reduced the risk that we're coating on our patients for a TE. So while the risk on the consent form was one out of 10,000, now the risk is one out of 1,000. Because uh, the patients that we are doing the TE are frail, they are actually elderly patients, they have New York Association class three or four, and practically we are moving a lot the, the TOE probe from the transgastric and then up to mid-esophageal in order to get the views that we need for the to guide the structural intervention. So practically there are, as you remember this Jack paper that there is a 25% of patients that they will get micro esophageal tear that practically you cannot detect with echo, but they detect that with barium and also OGD. So as you will see for each uh, procedure, we are getting uh, adapted uh, TE views. And uh, practically initially we start with the mitra clip being at now we have a dedicated tri clip under Abbott and then Pascal with Edwards and of course the Evoque that received the C mark 19th of October. So we use uh, all our all our uh, the eyes, all our senses, and as, as I said, quick maneuvers to guide the interventionists through the procedure. With Becky, we wrote um, a simple a paper on the six steps that we need in order and the tips and tricks on how you can get the best imaging when you're guiding a tricuspid edge to edge repair. For example, first you're navigating the, you see on the delivery system, you engage that to the right atrium and then subsequently you start moving the, um, uh, the delivery system into the right ventricle and then um, eventually you, uh, you focus to the grasping view until you grasp um, the leaflets that you, they are of interest. And of course, it's very important to assess post-procedural the outcome. Sometimes, for example, as you know, we may use one uh, or more clips. Uh, we first position the one clip and then we add another one for greater stability on the valve, depending on where the jet is coming, especially when we have um, commissural jets that we need, we may need uh, two clips or more. But um, another, um, I, I did, uh, I'm not a CMR specialist, only because I did CMR when I was doing my PhD. So <laughs> after that, like I was echo focused. So, but I love CMR and I can see uh, uh, that's such a great value for tricuspid valve disease. Uh, first of all, it helps us uh, uh, as a pre-screening tool for structural interventions or surgery. As you can see, there are studies that they associate the tricuspid regarstan volume more than 45 ml and TR fraction more than 50% that they are associated with high risk for cardiovascular events. But uh, another important aspect that uh, I was discussing with uh, Joao Calvacante about the triluminate is the RV fibrosis that he told me that he is uh, will have this on the publication. So for us, uh, RV fibrosis has a very special meaning in order to get you back to the first slides to understand at which stage the disease is of uh, the RV impairment and remodeling. CT is very important for tricuspid valve and annulus, primarily when we have the caval procedures that we need to see the um, anatomy of IVC and SVC, also when we have intracardiac devices and leads. And um, oh, uh, it's very important that uh, the, we have overcome now the technical challenges that we had when we have atrial arrhythmias, and we use very minimal contrast for those patients that they have CKD. But um, it adds an extra tool to assess uh, patients with tricuspid regurgitation and to enable us to decide which device is the appropriate for their anatomy. So in a sense, as you know, we now personalize the care of the patients with tricuspid regurgitation. But um, hybrid imaging is also very important that uh, it helps, helps with the coaxial, coaxial ability to, for the tricuspid valve annulus in different patients. And uh, when we embed the existing CT or MRI scan with the echo, it helps guiding the fluoroscopy in order to make the procedure more successful. 
Then, uh, as I said, in England at the moment, uh, there is a question about compassionate use of eyes, echocardiography. Uh, but I know there, there, for example, there is extensive use in, uh, from the European side in Switzerland, in uh, Germany, of course. And I know that you're using it extensively here. And as you can see, it helps us a lot when we have a, a significant dropout and we cannot see the leaflets. We recently had a couple of patients with bioprosthetic aortic valve replacement that they need an edge repair. And we felt that it's uh, crucial to have uh, a nice uh, a nice um, there to guide their procedure. Now, RV hemodynamics are very important. And actually, when we start discussing these patients with tricuspid degradation and at the MDT meeting, our um, structural intervention, they always want to see a right heart cath because they want to make sure that the patient does not have any elements of precapillary pulmonary hypertension in order to ensure the success of the procedure. So just uh, at the recent British Society of ECHO meeting, we were discussing this parameter on who are the patients who will benefit. You can see that in uh, we have precapillary, isolate postcapillary, but combined pre and postcapillary. And now we have latest devices. I will show you later that they can be used in such a combination of pre and postcapillary. Just to show you a clinical example of a patient, uh, 60, well, that we discussed uh, at the webinar with PCR tricuspid focus group. Um, he was a 61 year old male patient that he, he was referred to me in my clinic for consideration of tricuspid edge to edge repair. And uh, this patient had a dilate cardiomyopathy with severe LV impairment, ejection fraction 15% on the MRI. And uh, I will show you the right heart cath data later. Uh, so he had indeed severe tricuspid regurgitation. His pro BNP was 3,300. And he had a, a bit of CKD with EGFR 38. And just to mention, of course, that up to now, patients with um, significant pulmonary hypertension, they have been excluded from trials. This patient, actually, as you can see, he was on appropriate medical therapy, uh, heart failure therapy uh, with digoxin, also amiodarone, or everything that is needed, um, he was on it. But uh, as you can see here from the transthoracic echo, that the right heart is uh, significantly dilated, but it's also severely impaired. And there is uh, such a huge coaptation gap with torrential tricuspid regurgitation. But the LV is also, as we said, 15% was the ejection fraction calculated with MRI. And then uh, here, a better view of uh, the LV, and uh, we performed the a TE on the patient, and as you can see, while the right heart is uh, is not uh, massively dilated as we have a precapillary pulmonary hypertension patient, but it's still uh, significantly severely impaired. And um, the TR, uh, of course, here is underestimated because it's torrential, meaning that there is a coaptation gap. We cannot apply the Bernoulli equation. So here, the uh, hemodynamics were PVR of 3.4 wood units. And um, the mean uh, pulmonary pressure was 33 millimeters per mercury. And of course, the LVDP was 18 millimeters per mercury. And as you can see, because of the biventricular failure, we felt that the patient practically needs to be referred for a heart transplant. And actually, he got his heart transplant already. And he is a different man. So there would be no prognostic benefit to do a tricuspid edge to edge repair, practically, if, because he was clinically stable when I saw him. And of course, the, it was not a bridge to transplant, but the patient needed simply a heart transplant. Now, going to the RV, it's very important actually to understand the difference between pressure and volume loading because it has an effect of understanding the pre and post capillary element of pulmonary hypertension. And um, when we did the first studies for RV, we saw that uh, the, there is difference relationship between the LV and RV. You can see here a patient with pulmonary, capillary, uh, pulmonary arterial hypertension that the RV is massively dilated, pressure loaded. And then uh, the tricuspid is the ventricular tricuspid regurgitation, tricuspid angulus dilates, and then subsequently we have severe TR. Also, these patients come with the pericardial effusion, which is a very bad prognostic marker. But um, I said the word prognosis just now. And practically, we, when we see a patient with RV impairment or RV compromise, we need to understand the parameters that they are diagnostic and they may make us suspicion or suspect raised pulmonary pressures and those that they are prognostic and they're actually immediately related to outcomes because this is what we care about. 
Here is an example of the acceleration time that we are using. And uh, the more the pulmonary pressure is increased, the acceleration times get shortened. And here you can see that there is a, a systolic notch, which is immediately related to the pulmonary vascular resistance. And practically these patients have a very poor prognosis that they have this pulmonary systolic notch because the PVR gets significantly increased. Then another important thing that it has, we have seen TAPSI everywhere and we keep using it. However, when we have severe tricuspid regurgitation or more than moderate, the TAPSI will get overestimated, meaning pseudo-normalized. Pseudo and you can see at the bottom a patient with a um, sinus venous defect, volume load RV, that practically has a TAPSI of 30. It's too much because the RV is volume loaded. And of course, pressure load RV, that it's a, an objective marker, the TAPSI that's 10. And uh, we say that it's a while it has good correlation with the RV ejection fraction. We cannot use it as a surrogate for a clinical trial, for example, tricuspid now in 2023. We will use it in conjunction with other parameters. Another uh, parameter we have been measuring in, in our lab is myocardial performance index. And this is because it's very simple. You get from the RV free wall and practically S uh, wave less than 12 has uh, bad means bad prognosis. Well, actually, the isovolumic relaxation time has uh, shown to be one of the first markers for early RV impairment. So when it's uh, prolonged, we suspect that this patient may have some degree of RV impairment. And uh, it's actually independent of the chamber geometry, so it helps quite a lot. Now, a very important point for the RV stolic pressure, as you know, and uh, to our sonographers, we say this every day, even if the patient doesn't have any TR, we need to get the continuous wave Doppler because the patient may have increased pulmonary pressures. And the TR jet is completely irrelevant to the right ventricular stolic pressure. While we, we, I spent 10 years in pulmonary hypertension unit at Hammersmith, we were scanning pulmonary hypertensive patients day and night. And practically when the patient has severe tricuspid regurgitation, we were truly worried about the patient. But when the patient had RVSP of 130, we were not so worried. And of course, with mild tricuspid regurgitation. Of course, the patients were on prostanoids and all advanced therapies. But to show you a bit the contrast on where we would be more alert about the patient. And right atrial size also. With um, uh, Lawrence Ratsky, we wrote um, like a, a part of a chapter in 2015 in ASC Dynamic Echo. And now we are, you will see in a few weeks' time, the new ASC guidelines for uh, right heart that um, I'm honored to participate. Right atrial size is very important in uh, right ventricular failure. And uh, the more the right atrium gets dilated, as for example, atrial fibrillation patients, the more we are worried about our patients. And then, of course, they get uh, a dilated uh, inferior vena cava then it starts uh, compromising during a respiratory collapse. And then this patient will have increased right atrial pressure. These patients, they, in general, they are not doing as well as the patients that they don't have IVC dilatation and uh, they have normal respiratory collapse. But uh, this is uh, when we are teaching our sonographers, we remind them that there are some parameters that they are heart rate dependent. So we index them for the heart rate. And also we never forget that the right ventricular soil pressure is associated with body surface area and also the age. Because in England, there was also a huge problem because a, a private healthcare company that they were doing outreach echoes, they defined as pulmonary hypertension every single patient that has an RVSP more than 40 millimeters per mercury. And suddenly we would see 90 year old patients coming to us as referrals for pulmonary hypertension with RVSP 42 millimeters per mercury. So it was like crazy referrals, but so on the top, on the top, we have a patient with idiopathic PAH and you can see actually the patient has an ICD and at the bottom, uh, actually you saw the video at the bottom was a patient with a large tumor obstructing the RV inflow. And um, then uh, my PhD was based on a 3D RV assessment. Practically, you know that one of the first things that we did was endocardial epicardial mapping. It has uh, 3D, does not include the RVOT. So uh, the people that they love MRI, you are very right to love MRI because it's much superior than uh, 3D echo. And then uh, usually with the 3D, it's a sim but simply it can be bedside, we can use it. It's reproducible and we get the myocardial volume and then the myocardial mass. 
But um, here I mentioned the MRI because when we, Jonathan Afilal, we were doing our studies, then uh, he interestingly proved that the learning curve for MRI is actually much smaller when compared with to 3D. And uh, that now, he said that in 2012 and 2023, Joao, uh, when we were discussing about the Triluminate study, he told me, yes, that's true. Because practically, I'll show you later, that Triluminate showed a significant change on the MRI while actually shows no change on the echo. And it has certain reasons why. And uh, you can see that we have, we use now AI to actually get the models from external sources and practically create a 3D imaging model for the RV quicker. And uh, of course, still needing the input of the physician. Now, strain is very important. We use it uh, as a routine uh, back home. And, and uh, we see that um, strain, um, the area strain, as we proved uh, in a publication that we, uh, we did at Jack, it has a greater importance in outcomes uh, when compared to free wall strain or the global longitudinal strain. And the area strain is the ratio between the longitudinal and circumferential strain, which actually is the way that the RV compromises during pressure overload. I believe a lot in RV contractile reserve. I love exercising my patients. And this is because the uh, RV pathology and the TAPSI and the RVSP, when it was done with exercise and the change actually uh, made a huge difference on those patients that they will have bad outcomes. Uh, at the moment, Philip Lors, uh, he's doing a study with exercising his patients that they are getting tricuspid edge to edge repair. So there is nothing in literature in relation to structural interventions, but they will be soon. But uh, now I start uh, discussing few studies. Uh, why RV is so important? As I showed you earlier, uh, the RVPA coupling can be easily done with the ratio of TAPSI versus the RVSP. And uh, Mickey Brenner, uh, together with Becky Han, uh, he, they did this wonderful study that they showed that when this is reduced, the ratio, it has been associated with an all-cause mortality. And it is indeed very easy to perform as a ratio. I think it's important to take it into consideration in order to see how the RV, as I said, will react after a procedure. But we know now that uh, when the RV has an ejection fraction less than 45%, because uh, the longitudinal and circumferential function is getting compromised, these patients will have worse prognosis and outcomes after uh, an intervention. So we tend to pay attention to the RV performance, where actually at the beginning, when we were performing the tricuspid regurgitation and the procedures, we were focusing only to the TR. And then we said, hang on, we need to see the whole picture. How is the RV? And we know now that they, we have, a, a, we wrote a, an editorial with Maurice Serrano about the adaptive and maladaptive, uh, maladaptive remodeling of the RV. For example, an RV that's dilated, the tri tricuspid annulus is dilated, the patient has already established atrial fibrillation, significant TR, and of course, um, impaired uh, RV indices, and then there is lack of contractile reserve. It's very hard actually to get reverse remodeling. Now, because I love uh, also our surgeons and uh, every surgeon around the globe, uh, they have uh, great outcomes with uh, tricuspid valve surgery. And as you know, there are current completed studies uh, that they describe new um, ways of uh, fixing the tricuspid annulus, tricuspid annuloplasty, or um, the, of course, the tricuspid valve replacement. And also there are three at the moment ongoing uh, trials on uh, surgical trials. And um, just to mention this paper from uh, uh, Julien Dreyfus, which uh, uh, he's a pioneer in this tri-score for isolated tricuspid surgery that includes a multi-parametric approach for clinical biomarkers such as GFR and elevated bilirubin and echo parameters to see whether a patient is appropriate for isolated tricuspid surgery and whether they will benefit or not from a tricuspid intervention. Now, why is that? Why uh, Zhu Yen actually want to do the tri-score? Practically, to get a, a more precise selection of the patients before uh, the structural interventions. And of course, uh, to see whether a patient is suitable for surgery. 
Here you see that we have a, a tricuspid pandemic, meaning that the, there is such an explosion of uh, devices at the TCT. We saw so many new devices being mentioned that actually they, they target this individualized approach and the unique anatomy of the tricuspid uh, valve. The Triluminate, I know that uh, Jordi said that you also part, are a part of the Triluminate uh, study. Uh, it is very important for all of us. Um, it showed the significant improvement in the quality of life and relate to the TR reduction. And um, I mean, that's a very busy slide, but uh, there are certain thoughts that uh, we were discussing. First, it was associated with the quality of life. We saw, of course, that there was significant reduction, but there was a residual degree of TR, of course, post-procedure which may have affected the results. There has been discussion of that. And then uh, at 12 months, there was indeed uh, superior results uh, when compared to medical therapy alone. So is it a beneficial treatment? Yes. Um, then we need more strict uh, selection of our patients, possibly yes as well, because um, this is the imaging sub-study that was published, that was presented two days ago. And uh, Joao, what he did is now he took uh, certain uh, patients from the Triluminate study and uh, he compared the triclip and control. And practically, he saw significant RV volume reduction according to the CT. So the RV remodeled uh, within uh, 30 days and also 12 months. So it is very important. And then uh, also, he saw significant uh, TR reduction and volume reduction with the MRI. Uh, and as we know, as I told you, the MRI is more sensitive to assess the volumes. It's still the gold standard. So these are very important results to know that the Triluminate has a significant effect on our patient and, of course, reverse remodeling of the RV. And what he told us is practically when the tricuspid clip enters the right ventricle, it, the RV ejection fraction drops. So it doesn't get improved because it's the similar concept with the mitral, because at the beginning it will drop and then there, there will be RV reverse remodeling. But he did the effective ejection fraction, which is the forward stroke volume versus the end diastolic volume. And he saw that this indeed improved for the patient, which is very important. But you will see a short comment that you will see. Um, and he said, he told me that while actually there was significant change from with CMR and CT, you will see that there is not much change with echo, but that has to do with technical parameters like variability, the way that we are measuring certain echo parameters and so on. When we inserted the clip, and this is a publication then from 2021 in uh, Jack Case reports is that there is significant changes in pressure volume loops, not only for RV, but also for LV. So there is a, a significant improvement. And uh, here is an example from Philip uh, Lourdes that uh, when he did this echo, this comparing echo, hemodynamics and pulmonary hypertension is uh, practically those patients that they have invasive and echocardiographic proof of pulmonary hypertension, they didn't benefit from uh, the triclip, from edge to edge repair. So we tend to exclude these patients that they have significant pulmonary hypertension. And of course, uh, we, we get uh, recommended to do a right heart cath. But then uh, another important thing is when we are dealing with these patients post-capillary pH is to know when the, the main question and the main discussion around the, the world of imaging is to know when a patient will benefit from what we are doing as per intervention. And when a patient will develop this cardiohepatic syndrome, for example, like, uh, you know, cirrhosis, it's very diff and the RV gets dilated, impaired, the patient has ascites, they come with New York Association class four, then it's very difficult for the patient to reverse these symptoms. And, um, and then uh, Philip Lourdes published recently the BRIGHT study that practically showed with uh, Pascal how uh, th that they benefited the um, KCCQ score and uh, the um, NYH class and the reduction of TR. But also uh, they emphasize that these patients that they have liver cirrhosis is very difficult for the TR uh, to get uh, reversed and the RV to go back to normal. Um, I, I have a timer, so I, I will finish in six minutes. Um, we know now that uh, when uh, we have both severe tricuspid regurgitation and severe mitral regurgitation, we do not, uh, they used to do both at the same time, but now um, we are tending to do a staged uh, procedure, especially it's very interesting to know how you're doing it here, but in London we are doing it at staged 
because it seems that when we fix, for example, the mitral, then the tricuspid regurgitation will improve and the RV will improve because of the interventricular dependence. And then, of course, I mentioned that the, with the three valve registry, I want to mention simply that there is a part of patients that they have low cardiac output and they will develop, develop acute right side heart failure uh, when after a clip. And this was only 2.8%, but still a significant number for of our patients. And it seems we need to be very careful when we are dealing with biventricular impairment and also a significant uh, increased Euroscore. Now, coming to the evoke, I think I need to hide. Uh, I want to hide the top. I'm not sure how I can, but it's okay. Um, uh, practically, it shows uh, no mort mortality in 30 days. As you can see, two patients out of 25, uh, they had low cardiac output syndrome. And uh, you know that it received the C marked 19th of October. Now the three cent study, uh, it was presented yesterday. I want to present to you the updated outcomes that practically uh, it showed the significant TR reduction, 98.8% of patients, they had less than moderate TR. Most of them, they had mild TR, 93.8% of patients, which is actually when compared to the triclip, it shows full elimination of the tricuspid regurgitation. It's a very important step in the world of structural outcomes. And it seems that there was significant change, of course, when you have the evoke system plus uh, optimal medical therapy when compared to medical therapy alone. And um, then uh, we know that we have bicaval valve sense, uh, and this is important because the, it changes the, the target of the procedure. Practically, it aims to lower the pressure on the venous circulation, improves congestive symptoms. When uh, compared to the patients that they are receiving a clip and the improvement is gradual, those patients that they have the bicaval stents, they will, you will see an immediate improvement because there is immediate reversal of the hepatic, vo you know, we see a hepatic vo vein flow being corrected. And that's why they feel remarkably well. And you will see a quicker recovery of the RV. And I want to mention also to the trick valve, just to be fair with the studies, because it's also showed high procedural success and uh, in significant improvement in RV reverse remodeling and quality of life within six months. Now, tricuspid valve in valve replacement, we have also published at the journal patients that they receive valve in valve replacement is considered a very safe approach. Of course, as you know, they are the TV by prosthesis, they are very prone to degeneration and dysfunction. We have a lot of patients like this. Uh, so everything is a team approach. That's why the guidelines, they are emphasizing the hard team approach when it comes to the best, um, of course, a pro um, treatment for the patient. We have published, um, this is um, a case simply that we uh, did uh, on a patient who, who had already three open heart surgeries and then uh, they had the significant uh, tricuspid by prosthesis stenosis and then uh, this was presented at the PCR London valves last year that uh, Professor Redwood and Dr. Patterson they did the a tricuspid valve in valve repair uh, replacement but also very importantly we've seen that been doing been done also in patients that they are pregnant and they have also complications from uh, their bioprosthesis. So uh, it has ex had extensive application of uh, this approach. Now, two slides only from TCT23. We saw, an ex as I said, an explosion of new devices. This is an example of a tricuspid flow optimizer. So they are trying practically with polymer to make the, this system more close to the native uh, tricuspid valve and practically it's uh, going into the annulus, anchoring, and then uh, it resembles the position and the motion of the tricuspid valve. And it seems that it, uh, these patients, while they didn't have any tricuspid stenosis, but they had a significant improvement of hemodynamics. Then you know the trillium, when compared to the previous bicaval stent that I showed you, it's a unified stent, and practically it's a cross caval. Uh, device that was presented by Philip Lourdes and also it shows that the RV immediately remodels back to normal. And then uh, this was an interesting presentation by Georg Hausleiter about the topaz uh, tricuspid valve prosthesis and he presented a patient with carcinoid. And he has done this in 13 patients as compassionate use which shows imp impressive results in the reduction of TR grade and new association. So 
Then uh, just to mention that also there was a very interesting paper uh, 29th September at Europace that shows the team approach of when, when we have patients with lead related uh, tricuspid regurgitation. And uh, it's the first time that there is a unified approach for two things that ICE is superior in imaging, in, uh, in identifying the lead impingement and also ascertaining the severity. So they recommend ICE when feasible and also consider the lead extraction prior to tricuspid edge to edge repair. And this is the algorithm on where we have severe symptomatic TR and we, the patient is brought to the structural heart team approach. And we always, as I said, we need an EP physician because these patients, they recommend extraction and then to see whether the TR improves. Last slide is the TVART document uh, from Becky. Uh, it, it helped us actually discuss a lot of endpoints. That's my, okay. Uh, and um, practically it uh, includes imaging endpoints, circulating biomarkers and organ function and safety endpoints. For example, bleeding complications, device related complications. And this is because uh, at the beginning we had uh, the endpoint of death or uh, hospitalization or the endpoint of whether the tricuspid regurgitation will improve, will reverse. But now we care more about the patient's outcomes and long-term outcomes and of course, durability of all the devices that they are around us. And with that, I would like to thank you so much. It's a great honor to be with you today. That's true. Actually, they so they have a lot of uh, parameters that they show. They have correlated the invasive uh, PA to uh, RV uncoupling with uh, the echocardiographic parameters. They show that TAPC with uh, the ratio with RVSP is quite reliable. I understand the limitation that he says, but at the moment I feel that we when we discuss the PA RV uncoupling, we need to discuss with the RV parameters. For example, when we are using for RV performance, we are not going to say the ratio is that, and that's the end of the day, but we'll discuss the TR, uh, TR severity, the, also the RV performance when it is with fractional area change, and also the, we do the basal diameter, some parameters that I couldn't show because of time, but they are very important, you know, to, we always discuss is a single marker uh, enough to determine the patient's future. And with the RV is impossible, you know, because there are so many parameters. We'll see how the RV changes over time, the remodeling. We see if there is any uh, element of pressure overload, whether the patient will need the right heart cath. So yes, it is a nice marker to have an estimate. However, you need to take into consideration with all the echo other echocardiographic markers. So this uh, practically, uh, Joao has done, uh, we were discussing about this and he seem, he wants to, he will publish the predictive value of this ratio of the RV stroke volume. As um, I showed you, it seems that it's more sensitive when it comes to the traditional parameters, when we have, for example, the RV ejection fraction, because now we are more interested in the value of stroke volume for the RV. And um, I, he, he will actually, he has, he's writing up the paper that as you say, and this is a great comment that it shows a greater predictive value when compared to traditional parameters. That's a very interesting. So it says with the transition of uh, many structural heart procedures to conscious sedation without intubation, how do you use the emerging the intracardiac echo versus TE for procedural guidance? And thank you so much. That's a, a great question because that has been the topic of discussion. And actually, as I said, we are trying to persuade our hospitals to get ice. 
and I know that you are extensively using ice here. I believe that ice, uh, like it's, is, is a great part of our future. Um, of course, um, because as you say, it's very important that we use ice and the patient doesn't need intubation. We save a lot of time. The patient gets uh, like to the ward possibly after a clip. Well, now, for example, we have to follow a certain sequence that we get the patient to the OIR and like it's as if they had a cardiac operation while well, it's not needed. And then, um, so I agree that the we as imagers, it will be a part of our skills to learn intracardiac echo and practically help our colleagues to, to use more ice than uh, TE. But of course, TE, we, we always do TE for pre-procedural assessment. And uh, again, another thing that we were discussing is uh, the value of having uh, an anesthetist next to us. It makes our life so much easier. Uh, we've seen patients that they are very frail and I'm giving them midazolam in an outpatient setting. And I say, okay, now I'm doing the transgastric and I'm like, uh, we are doing it, but it's not, uh, it's best to have now dedicated lists of pre-procedural echo because it's a very different protocol. Uh, the pictures that we need to we have to take approximately a hundred sequences. So I think we are heading into a more procedural aspect of having dedicated lists, eyes in every cath lab and so on. Number two. Great thought. Uh, I wanted to ask you a few questions if you could expand on the exercise piece. What is the exact indication that you need so when uh, I, I, as I said, I love uh, exercising, and uh, practically we, when the patient is borderline frail, and we see an RV that is, uh, for example, almost a bit dilated, mildly dilated, and uh, we say it's borderline function, and uh, then uh, sometimes we have borderline right ventricular stolic pressure, what I'm going to do is get the patient to exercise. And then I will assess the TAPSI again. And if, but most importantly, if the RVSP increases, we had the patient, if the right ventricular stolic pressure increases, and then I will see the performance of the RV. For example, if it becomes better, the contractility, or it becomes worse. We had the patient recently that she was complaining of shortness of breath. And when we exercise, we exercise here, then the RVSP from normal, it went actually to 70 millimeters per mercury. And this patient, will, we, they are, the TR was actually moderate, moderate to start with, moderate during peak exercise. So this patient, I'm sending here directly to pulmonary hypertension unit. And of course, to be on optimal medical therapy. So I think it has in those borderline cases of uh, the RV that is not like, or for example, if we see an RV that's impaired, we want to know whether this RV actually during exercise will contract. Which stage, I show you four stages, which stage are we going to classify the patient to? Is it like reverse, can be reverse remodel or it's like an adapted remodeling that will not change? Yeah. I have a question which is, you know, first of all, fantastic presentation. This is really a, an amazing uh, area. So, you know, I think one of the challenges with the TR is that um, risk is not equal to benefit, and, and there are a lot of prognostication both markers as well as the studies looking at prognosis of people with TR, suggesting it, it's worse. But doing something about so improving that TR is not necessarily clear. In, in some cases, that all those patients will benefit. In which patients will necessarily benefit? And and I, um, you know, I think that shows when you set up that. People with mild TR having a worse prognosis than people with no TR comparably that has to do with the association of other disease states or left sided heart disease, et cetera. And so it's thinking about sort of disaggregating those, you know, do we have better sort of clarifying definitions of who really is going to benefit, for example, from meat extraction, um, you know, to, to really have an improvement in their TR risk? And now that we've joined trials, we haven't been able to really get at the, the benefit of. Situations because um, people haven't been randomized and we've been using bifestive valve replacement on such a small subset of individuals that we really don't have sort of a true randomized population where we can assess what parameters for they benefit. But now we do with, with the edge hand repair trials. You may be sort of 
sort of talk about what kind of work is being done in that area to identify who are the people who are likely to, to, to benefit long term. And you know, that illuminate because you are also participating, they said they are all comers, practically because they want to resemble the real world study. So it's uh, versus whether you will have a real world study, which I applaud, of course, the three illuminate investigators for doing that, because then we can discuss, as you say, who are the patients that they will truly benefit, or rather than highly selecting the patients. So if you want to highly select your patients so that they will have a very successful outcome, you get a patient with uh, you know, very small coaptation gap, uh, like, uh, okay, they have atrial fibrillation, but not so long to have a huge uh, right atrium, and then a normal RV that has not yet remodeled, and then you do a tri clip and it's successful, and also that the TR will uh, drop to mild, so it's the perfect result. But when they said the uh, all comers, practically they had patients with impaired RV, with um, a coaptation gap that was on the borderline. So, you know, it's like these patients, and also. For us, it's very important to have a heart failure physician. Also, when we did the PCR tricuspid focus group, referral group, the care of the elderly physician, because these patients are very frail. Sometimes they say, I'm experiencing some shortness of breath, and the care of the elderly physician will do an assessment of what's causing this. And if they, if they feel that it's purely cardiac, then they will refer the patients to us. I think... As you say, they have been the studies, for example, with us that they show the societies, New York Association, class three to four, and the atrial fibrillation, that they are not going to benefit that much as if we have a very clean population as highly screened. But now we tend to offer help even those patients, for example, with pacemaker leads. Remember that in five years before, we would used to exclude these patients and say, we cannot do anything. Now they say how we will move the tricuspid lead that we will extract. That's why I, show, I wanted to show this Europace paper. They say we have to extract the lead to see if this will improve. So going back to, I think, to the basics, we did the referral meeting in London like a month ago. Why? Because we believe that uh, now we need to refer more our patients to the dedicated heart valve clinics. And uh, the meet, MDT meetings that we are running to have a heart failure physician, the care of the elderly physician, and you know, make sure that the patient is on optimal medical therapy. If they have, for example, cirrhosis, to take this into consideration. So like to have an MDT approach and say who will benefit mostly and who will not benefit. Because someone actually showed um, a very, very interesting slide and they had the word hospice. So, you know, we have to also to say to, and to, the, to limit the, sometimes the expectations of our patients that they read Google and they say, this is a magic intervention that uh, will make me go back to 50 as I was 50 years ago. And we have to limit their expectations and have discussion with their family and say, that's not really the case because you have a million other comorbidities. So it's like uh, having an MDT approach and discussion with the family and the patient. Thank you very much. Thank you.